Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I concur and join with the Prime Minister in his remarks about the terrible deaths in Orlando. On Monday, I joined a vigil of thousands of LGBT people in Soho in London to mourn the deaths of the 49. And also, I want to say we say thank you to all those all over this country who attended vigils on Monday night to show their concern and their horror about it. Quite simply, we defeat such atrocities through our love and our solidarity, and we need to send that message out. Three years ago, Mr Speaker, there was a cross-party agreement for the implementation of Section 40 of the Crime and Courts Act and to proceed with Leveson 2 once criminal prosecutions were concluded. The Prime Minister will be aware that today there is a lobby of Parliament by the victims of phone hacking. The Prime Minister said a few years ago, we all did too much cozying up to Rupert Murdoch. Well, some of his Tory Brexit colleagues are certainly closing up to Rupert Murdoch at the moment. But will the Prime Minister give a commitment today that he will meet the victims of press intrusion and assure them that he will keep his promise on this? Well, first of all, let me again echo what he said uh, about the Orlando bombings. In terms of um, uh, the uh, Leveson issue, we said that we'd make a decision about the second stage of this inquiry once the uh, criminal uh, investigations and prosecutions were out of the way. They are still continuing, uh, and so that is the situation there. I have met with victims of press intrusion, and I'm happy to continue to do so again. But I think right now people can accuse me of many things, but I think cozying up to Rupert Murdoch probably isn't one of them. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, my question was, will he meet the victims of phone hacking? I hope he will, because they deserve it, and he promised that he would meet them. A major th funder, Mr Speaker, of the Leave campaign said, and I quote, if it were up to me, I'd privatise the National Health Service. The Honourable Member for Uxbridge said, if people have to pay for NHS services, they will value them more. Both he and the Honourable Member for Surrey Heath are members of a government that has put the NHS into record deficit. These people are now masquerading as the saviours of the NHS, wolves in sheep's clothing. Didn't the Honourable Member for Totnes get it right when she rejected the duplicity of this argument in the Leave campaign and decided to join the Remain campaign? I was delighted with uh, what my right hon my honourable friend, the, the uh, member for Totnes, said about wanting, about changing her mind, which is a brave thing for politicians to do, and saying that she thought that the NHS would be safer if we remain inside a reformed European Union. And I believe that very profoundly because the key to a strong NHS is a strong economy. And I think there can't be any doubt the nine out of ten economists, the Governor of the Bank of England, the IMF, the OECD, all of these other organisations saying our economy will be stronger and it's a strong economy that delivers a strong NHS. Thank you Mr Speaker. Last week the Prime Minister gave a welcome commitment to the closing of the loophole in the posting of workers directive. We'll hold him to that but we're concerned about the exploitation of migrant workers and the undercutting of wages in this country as a result of that. On that issue, will the Prime Minister today commit to the outlawing of the practice of agencies that only advertise abroad for jobs that are in reality jobs in this country? First of all, he and I absolutely agree about the evils of modern slavery, and that is why this government passed the Modern Slavery Bill with all parties' support. We've doubled the fines that can be put on companies uh, for exploiting labour in this way. We've actually strengthened the Gangmasters Licensing Authority, and they've, com they've commenced and carried out a number of prosecutions, including in the east of England where I was yesterday. And so we'll continue to take action on every level to make sure that people are paid the wages that they should be paid and the protections are there on the minimum wage and now on the national living wage. I think all of those are, are vitally important and will continue with all of those measures. I want people to get a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Yeah. Yeah. Corbyn. Mr Speaker, my question was about outlawing the practice of advertising uh, by agencies only in other countries. Uh, tens of thousands of EU and other people have migrated to Britain, work in our public services and do a fantastic job.
Many people in Britain are also concerned about immigration and their local communities. Surely, Mr Speaker, what communities need is practical solutions, like the Migrant Impact Fund, set up by Gordon Brown when he was Prime Minister, to deal with the extra pressure on housing, schools and hospitals. Will the Prime Minister now concede that it was a mistake to abolish that fund, and will he work with us to reinstate it as a matter of urgency to give support to those communities that are facing problems on school places and doctor's surgeries? Um, uh, uh, he's absolutely right. Sorry, in answer to the question about advertising, about a workers' agencies, about employment agencies that only advertise uh, for overseas workers, we are looking at that to see if we can, and we've announced this already, to see if we can ban that practice because we don't believe that is right. Of course, the answer to so many of these questions is actually to make sure we are training, educating, and employing British people and getting them the qualifications they need to take on the jobs that our economy is creating. And today's unemployment figures are another reminder of that. In terms of um, funds to help communities impacted by migration, we have a pledge in our manifesto, which we're looking forward to bringing forward, which actually a controlled migration fund to make sure that we put money into communities where there are pressures, because of course there are some pressures and we do need to address them, and I'm happy that we'll be able to work on a cross-party basis to do that. As I've said many times, there are good ways of controlling migration, and one of them is the important rules we're bringing in so people don't get get instant access to our welfare system, but there are bad ways of controlling immigration, leaving the single market and wrecking our economy is certainly one of them. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today, a flotilla of boats is due to come along the Thames, uh, campaigning on fishing quotas not going to the UK domestic fleet. I've been looking out of the window and I haven't seen them come yet, but presumably they're on their way. The Prime Minister will be very well aware that reforms that were made three years ago actually put the power back into the hands of Member States and it's the UK Government that has given nearly two-thirds of the English and Welsh fishing quotas to just three companies, thus excluding small fishing communities all along our coasts. Can the Prime Minister stop blaming Brussels on this and tell our small-scale and sustainable fishing communities what action he will take to allow them to continue their work and indeed go further out in collecting fish? Well, well, first of all, can I thank him for saying that the reforms we carried through in the last Parliament, and my honourable friend, the member for uh, Newbury, was absolutely crucial uh, in delivering those changes. What we've actually seen in the last five years is an increase in the value of the UK fishing industry of something like 20%. And the point I would make is that we export every year uh, about a billion pounds worth of fish to the EU and there is no country in the world that has a trade agreement with the EU that doesn't involve tariffs, taxes on the sale of its fish. So there's no way we'd get a better deal from the outside than the deal we get on the inside. So working with our fishing communities, working with our fishermen, keeping that market open, open and making sure that we manage our fish stocks locally and appropriately is very much part of our plan. Jeremy Corbyn. But his government still did have and co quotas over to three very large companies at the expense of small communities around Britain. I hope he will reflect on that. Mr Speaker, with just eight days to go before the referendum, it's, it's, the Labour position is that we are going to be voting to remain because we believe it's the best way to protect families, protect jobs and protect public services. We would oppose any post-Brexit austerity budget, just as we have opposed any austerity budget put forward by this Government. So will the Prime Minister take this opportunity to condemn the opportunism of 57 of his colleagues who are pro-leave, who have suddenly, these are members who backed the bedroom tax, backed cutting disability benefits and slashing care for the elderly, who suddenly have now had a Damascene conversion to the anti-austerity movement. Does he have any message for them? Does he have any message for them at all? What I'd say to the right honourable gentleman is there are very few times when he and I are on the same side of an argument. And this must say to people watching back at home that when you've got the leader of the Labour Party and indeed almost all of the Labour Party, a Conservative government, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, the official Ulster Unionists and the Scottish National Party all saying we have huge disagreements but on this vital issue for the future of our country the best option for Britain is to vote to remain 
remain in a reformed European Union. That really says something. It says something. And the truth is this. This is a huge choice for our country. Choices have consequences. If we wake up on June the 24th and we've remained in, our economy can continue to move forward. If we vote out, the experts warn us we will have a smaller economy, less employment, lower wages, and therefore less tax receipts. And that's why we would have to have measures to address a huge hole in our public finances. And nobody wants to have an emergency budget. Nobody wants to have cuts in public services. Nobody wants to have tax increases. But I would say this, there's only one thing worse than not addressing a crisis in your public finances, than addressing it through a budget, and that is ignoring it. Because if you ignore a crisis in your public finances, you see your economy go into a tailspin, you see confidence in your country reduced. We can avoid all of this by voting Remain next week. Rangers Robertson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On Orlando and on the deaths in France, we on these benches join with the condolences that have been expressed by the Prime Minister and the Leader uh, of the Opposition. Yeah. We are now only a week away from the biggest question that the UK uh, has faced in a long time, and that is the continuing membership of the European Union. Exports and goods and services from the Scottish economy are massively important. Hundreds of thousands of jobs depend on them. Meanwhile, our public services, including the NHS, are supported by many hard-working people from elsewhere in the European Union. Yeah. Does the Prime Minister agree with me? If we want to protect jobs, if we want to protect our public services, we must vote to remain in the European yeah. Union. I, I do believe the most important argument, there are many arguments people make, but the most important argument is about the future of our economy. And it seems obvious to me, you can listen to the experts or you can just make a common sense argument. Today we have full access to a market of 500 million people. For an economy like Scotland's that is so, uh, uh, such a big exporting economy, there's no way we'd get a better deal with that single market on the outside than we get on the inside. And so if we left we would see our economy suffer, we would see jobs suffer, we'd see people's livelihoods suffer. That is just plain common sense. So I absolutely agree with him. For jobs and for livelihoods, we should remain in. And there is a consequence for public finances, because if our economy is doing less well, our public finances would, do it, would be doing less well, and that would have consequences for Scotland too. Thank you, Robertson. On that issue, uh, may I raise that with the Prime Minister, because today we have learned from a Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer and a former Labour Chancellor of the Exchequer that there would be likely to be £30 billion in cuts to public services or tax rises were there to be a Brexit vote. What impact would that have on public services in Scotland? Please can we learn now, before we vote, what impact would that have on the budget in Scotland that pays for the NHS in Scotland, for our schools in Scotland, for local government and for all key public services? Is that not yet another reason why we must vote to remain in the European Union? Well, what I say to the right honourable gentleman is that these figures are not based on what the Chancellor of the Exchequer is saying, they're based on what the Institute of Fiscal Studies and the National Institute of Economic and Social Research are saying. They are talking about a 20 to 40 billion hole in our public finances if Brexit were to go ahead. Now these are organisations often quoted across this House many times against the government because they are respected for their independence. So clearly if that is the impact on public finances, decisions to cut public spending in the UK budget do have an impact through Barnet on Scotland. And to anyone who says, um, well, these warnings, of course, uh, they could be wrong or, or they could be inaccurate, uh, and this is an uncomfortable point perhaps to make to the uh, right honourable gentleman, of course, there were warnings about the oil price before the Scottish referendum. It turned out actually to be worse than the experts warned. <laughs>